And um, I am incredibly uh, happy to be able to welcome you here today for our uh, parent university session on uh, angst. As the parent of a teenager, I worry about the anxiety uh, that my student feels, the anxiety that I feel about my student, and as superintendent of the Portland Public Schools, I'm thrilled that we have this opportunity to provide an opportunity for our community to learn by watching a award-winning documentary on this issue and then having an opportunity to engage with each other and with our staff on this incredibly important issue. Um, Parent University is something new that we started this year. Grace Valenzuela, who will be talking a little bit about logistics in a second, has been the uh, heart and soul of this effort. And it's our part of our Portland Promise strategy to ensure that we are more deeply connected with our community. Uh, many of you know about some of the previous activities that we've had and um, are becoming regulars, and you know that this is the greatest university because there are no grades, um, there are no finals, and there are no uh, tests or pressure. We don't want to create any angst um, as a result of being a part of the parent university. Uh -huh. So um, with that, I just want to thank you for being here. Hope that this will be uh, worth your while and and I'm um, incredibly grateful for the support that you give to the Portland Public Schools um, every day. And um, uh, I appreciate you being here, learning about this important topic um, that obviously matters to you and to your family. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Grace and um, enjoy the movie. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. So we are all ready to go. Thank you. So I want to introduce our panel members. Um, Dr. Brian Cavanaugh. Dr. Brian Cavanaugh is the uh, Director of Social Emotional Learning for Portland Public Schools. And he is the leader in helping the district achieve its whole student goal and the objectives of our Portland Promise. So his main duties include professional development for our staff and support the social emotional learning uh, goals for the district. Um, our panel members, our panel members are Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. We've been reorganizing ourselves. Oh, oh great. Okay. So <laughs> yes. Our panel members are um <clears throat> Greg Palmer, who is our Greg Palmer is the principal at Deering High School. Sophie Payson is a social worker here at um, <coughs> Portland High School. Catherine Haas is a social worker at Riverton Elementary School. Oh, sorry. Why? Because you were there. That's our relationship. Uh, at Longfellow Elementary School. And um, Stephanie Alexander, who is um, a, specialist, uh, um, a specialist in treatment of, of children children, adolescents, and young adults for 25 years. She's in private practice. Did I get everybody? Oh, I don't have that name here. So. I'm Jane Sautel. I teach music here. I was at Hall School for 21 years, and uh, my children went to school here. Okay. And I'll turn this over the microphone to you. Brian? 
want to thank you again for coming. We really appreciate you being here. It's uh, obviously an important topic that we all care about. I really appreciate the, the ending message of the uplifting message of it really just takes a caring uh, friend, adult, somebody else in a, a student's life to, to be able to support them and turn them around in these, these times of need. Um, so my job is to moderate the panel. Um, I'm hoping to not answer questions because we have some experts here. Uh, again, a range of expertise around clinical needs, school leadership, teaching, um, that have a lot of experience with a variety of students. And many of you are also parents, too. So you also have uh, that lens to look through things. So uh, what I would do, what I'm going to do is just start off with one question, but then we're going to put it out to you uh, if you have questions. I have a nice list of things that I can ask them. Um, but if you have questions that you'd want to uh, ask our experts, then we'd be happy to hear from you. So uh, I'd like just to start off. One of the things that they talked about in the um, in angst was uh, there's a difference between anxiety and just being stressed or anxious. So, how do you all see that difference um, in your work with students or or uh, in the classroom in general? And the important thing for you all to note is you'll, you'll have to talk in the microphone as well. So, what's that difference between anxiety and just stress or being anxious? Um, well, I think they, uh, in the movie, they did a really nice job in the beginning talking that we all have stress and that actually it can be a really positive thing and we can really grow from stress. I think the difference that we see with the teenagers is when, is that anxiety is more of a fear-based and it's more of something that can impact their ability to sort of get through their day or their ability to do something or our ability even as adults with anxiety to um, do something. So stress is something that we all have that's very normal and that like helps us. You know, it's good if we have a test that we're studying for um, and we feel a little stress about that, that's a good thing because we'll use that stress to prepare. That's, that's helpful, but um, anxiety is more when it impacts your ability to like do what you need to do through the day. Anybody want to add to that? Um, I, I agree with that, and I would just add to that by saying, you know, when I see somebody in their talk, they sometimes use those terms in, uh, um, for each other. So you have to define, you know, if you sit down and get a sense, a description of what that means to that child, and because sometimes they'll use stress and anxiety interchangeably. Um, I'm Catherine, and I've been at um, Longfellow for the past four years. I've been in the district at the elementary level for 28 now. What I see in elementary schools is um, lots of stress and lots of normal anxious feelings. Um, and we spend a lot of time in elementary schools learning how to manage our stress and use various skills and tools that we teach to manage anxious feelings and anxious moments. It varies from kid to kid. I think it becomes problematic when it throws a kid off their normal developmental trajectory or, or out of the normal range of activities that are um, normal. So for example, every kindergartner has separation feelings or separation anxiety. It's only a problem when it turns into something that really interferes with school attendance. Um, or preoccupies the child at school so severely that they can't learn. Um, but I think most kids really learn how to manage anxiety um, from the stresses and challenges in elementary school, and that's a good thing. I just add that people are saying, but I think it's about who's in control. So if the stress and anxiety are in control and it's debilitating and students can't function, then, then it's, clear, it's, it's clearly not healthy. And if it's, if it's uh, normal nervousness that helps you to uh, work hard and do your best, you know, that's okay. It's a, it's a biological imperative that, that, we are, that we experience stress. And, um, but when it's in control of us and it starts shutting us down and shuts students down, then it, it crosses that line, I think. 
Um, so Grace, you mentioned there might be questions that people have written down. We can certainly take those if you want to collect them, but we can also open it up to any questions that you might have in the audience. And uh, if it's okay with you all, the microphone will be good too, so we can uh, hear everyone's question too. Thank you. I know for what it sounds like a lot of you guys have been in the game for a, a while, you know. And I'm wondering, is the debilitating stress that we saw in, in, in the film, is that something you're seeing way more of now than when you first got in the game? Excellent question, thank you. Yeah, I think we all said yes. I started my career probably 25 years ago or more, and the number, I, I probably saw a few children with stress, and a lot of those would have been had experiences of some type of trauma or something, you know, maybe some other anxieties around learning disabilities. The number of kids that I see today with anxiety is, it's, it's really astounding and, and very, very notable. I, I mean, I have ideas about why that is for a variety of reasons, which maybe we'll talk more about, but I just want to let somebody else talk. Um, yeah, I would definitely say in the high school, I think, first of all, it starts a lot younger. We're seeing it at a lot younger ages, and then I've been here for... I, don't, I think like 14 years or something, and I definitely in the last five or six years feel like there's been a huge increase. The way it sort of uh, manifests in the high schools, there's a lot more students that have um, needs for accommodations because of the stress and anxiety that's impacting their ability to, to get through the day, so it's definitely increased. But I also think, <laughs> sorry, I just was thinking that one of the things I liked about this video is how that student said that it's a curse, but it's also a strength. And I just, I, I do think there's an increase in it, but I also think, I know that the other social worker at the high school's here too, we talk a lot about um, how much more resilient and stronger kids are too. So although there's a huge increase in anxiety, I think they also have just an ability to, they do a better job um, talking about it, labeling it, identifying it, and getting help for it, I think, than we might have done in our generation. Um, at the elementary level, we definitely see many more students with um, anxiety. And um, at the elementary level, that often presents as a, um, somatic concerns, stomach aches, headaches, um, feeling ill, but mostly stomach aches. We have a lot of students with accommodations. Um, and um, for that reason, and because so many more students are struggling with what we now, I think, call normal stress, um, we, I think we change, we've changed the environments, and I think we've changed the way we do um, the culture. So for example, all students take motor breaks now, not just the students with accommodation plans, but teachers just have it built in that they will do, you know, so many motor breaks and we have stations set up on all the floors of the school for that purpose and we teach kids, all kids at the school, how to access those um, opportunities because it really helps with the mind-body connection and, and it gives kids a sense of control. There are, you know, steps I can take to ease the way I'm feeling right now, which is what we want to send them off into the world with. I would add we sometimes use the term emotional intelligence and that that's part of what the experience of anxiety offers students, offers ourselves, is how do we develop the skills to manage that experience because it's an expected part of life and we try, if we try to just avoid it or deny it or um, that's when we get into trouble but it's uh, just another challenge that we all have to learn how to manage at some point. Yeah, as a teacher. Um, what Sophie was saying about students being able to label it is important, but what I'm seeing in my classes is also, especially older students, reaching out to younger students and saying, oh yeah, I felt that way too. Oh yeah, that's perfectly normal. I mean, we recently had a, a very casual sort of performance in the building. I'm a music teacher, and some of my younger students were very concerned about people videotaping them and posting it online, and I kind of dismissed it and in fact it happened while we were walking around the building that people did that and they were showing me on their phones like well we they just videotaped us down the hall and this happened and it was like three minutes later and it was my 
older students, my seniors and my juniors, who kind of pulled them aside and said, you've got to have, you know, you've got to put yourself out there. Like, someone's always going to say something like that to you, but you're doing a great job. We're doing this together. I'm in that video, too. Take a deep breath. I mean, it was, it was really great. And so the fact that maybe more of our students are self-identifying as, you know, being anxious or having anxiety is, you know, a struggle. It's also given them an empathy and, you know, an inner strength and some leadership that maybe they didn't have, didn't acknowledge. Yeah, I, yeah, it's up, I think. And I, other things are up as well. Um, so the rise of social media is up. The 24-hour um, news cycle that calamitizes calamities is up. Um, the things that feed anxiety are up, and I think anxiety is up as well. Um, but it's not up all by itself. I think we've, I think we've, we've built the steps on that ladder to, to move it up. So, yeah, I think it's up. We saw a hand up over here. Does anxiety just start off light and then does it keep getting worse until it hits its peak? Yeah, that's an excellent question because I think that absolutely can happen. Um, sometimes in my clinical practice, I'll tell people a story about a dog that I had, my favorite dog, and we would go out running. And one day, there was a cattle grate that he, we, he was near when a car went over it and it made a really loud crashing sound. And all of a sudden, a few days later when I was running, he would hit the ground as soon as we approached that cattle grate. And then all of a sudden that cattle grate was silver. It would generalize to other things like the manhole cover or the guardrail on the road. So depending on the way that we deal with anxiety, yeah, you can see it start to escalate. And on the other hand, there I just definitely want to say there are skills that you can use to turn it around and have it go in the other direction. But but certainly I, I can see it as an escalating thing in certain people's lives, yeah. I, I would just add that that's a great question and it's an opportunity to comment that when you have that beginning feeling that's the best time for students, kids, parents, teachers to respond um, because it's easier to intervene and manage on the way up rather than when it's up or somewhere on the way down. So catching that signal early and working with it and acknowledging it and talking to somebody you like um, about it is really a great idea. Thank you. The questions? You know, I think we, we're living in a an achievement and performance driven society. And that filters into our educational system, especially in the way that we test kids, constantly testing and expecting a certain um, level of achievement that then is reflected back on the teacher. And all kids learn differently, so sometimes the rhetoric and the reality don't actually jive. And I wonder if we need to look at how we are pushing that type of performance with kids. You know, you see little uh, kindergartners going into the computer lab to take tests. And people will say, well, you know, they're so used to computers, but they're not used to testing. And what they're doing is they're just pushing every button like they do on a game. And one of them is going to come up right. But on the test, maybe they're frozen out. And then that performance that doesn't measure up to whatever that standard is, is reflected. And it carries on from kindergarten up and up and up. And then when they get to getting ready for college, that anxiety has just been building. And like that young man said, 
started out maybe very small and just grew and maybe we cultivated it in our educational system. I'm going to hand that one to the principal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, th I think it's a, I figured we'd end up talking about testing at some point. Um, so here's my opinion. I think we want too much. We want too many things to be true in the same moment. So I think um, it can be stressful for students to expect too little of them. And it can be stressful for students to expect too much. And, and for me, too much doesn't mean a high expectation on a single thing. It's a high expectation on too many things at the same time, all the time, because we can't figure out what's most important. And so, and we're afraid because we want students to go on to live successful, happy lives. So how about if we're just good at everything all the time? And, and then we want students to not be stressed out as well, which is really stressful <laughs> in that climate. So I think if I could wish anything for um, during high school, or since that's the school where I'm at, it would be to slow down. Not to expect less, because I think we can actually expect more when we slow down. And there are countries whose educational systems work more on the premise of slowing down, having less content to cover, but really looking it over on a close, on a close level. And then the things, all the things you don't have time to study, you can apply your deeper learning to figuring out instead of knowing a little bit about everything. And so I think it's a great question. I think it's a complicated question. For me, I think we have to stop wanting too much. Yeah. All right, I'm going to make a plug for the arts. <laughs> Because I think that's one way that students, and not necessarily the arts, but student selectives in high school can really give them some balance in their lives. So I tell my students who a lot of them are pretty high achieving and they come in like, you know, why isn't this an honors class? And, I'm gonna, and I just tell them, just assume you have 100 and we'll work from there. And I can hear the air go out of the room. They're like, oh, assume I have 100. So my, um, in my practice room, some of the students wrote on the, they took um, whiteboard markers and they wrote on the windows, we're learning something. And I just thought that was really great. Because they're learning something at their own pace. Everybody kind of progresses at their own rate. It's not high stakes testing. And yet they know that their brains are developing and they're taking on a challenge. And it gives them a sense of accomplishment. So as your kids are looking at courses in middle school, I would make a strong plug to have them do something that they are learning just because it's part of their lifelong learning, which doesn't start when they're adults. It starts when they're young. So that's my plug. And, and just to add to that, I think that some of the skills that we learn in school are the, some of the best coping strategies in terms of arts and music and even physical exercise, which I think is another thing that's declining and another factor in terms of um, you know what we see contributing to anxiety, people spending you know, not against video games or, or social media, but, but we tend to see less exercise. So all these things are great coping skills. The questions will go here and then up there. I don't need the microphone. You know. okay. I can talk loud. <laughs> um, I, my, I am um, a mom of a four-year-old anxious child who is definitely uh, emotionally intelligent. Um, so I was wondering if you're seeing a direct correlation between um, a emotionally intelligent child um, in turn like relating to anxiety. So that's part one. Um, and they mentioned a lot of tools um, on the video, but they were so quick. So I was wondering if you could kind of go over these tools that you're talking about um, to review so that we can kind of use them to help them at a younger age um, as I think is kind of, you know, getting in tune with um, that. That was my question. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, great question. I do think sometimes that children who are um, sensitive, empathic, um, socially related, um, do sometimes appear to have um, a greater vulnerability um, to, to feeling anxious because so much resonates and they notice and they're connecting. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I don't think that's a terrible thing. It just means you need a good toolbox. Um, and I think there are many ways to approach a toolbox. I think it varies developmentally. What works at age three and four is not what you take to Portland High. Um, but for, for little kids, um, just the ability to talk with someone, I mean, is in large part what we teach, the language, the, the vocabulary, the language, and the practice. Hmm? Oh, I thought you said four. Oh, you, yeah, okay. We all heard four, sorry. <laughs> all right. So in fourth grade, I think the mind-body stuff is, is what we see a lot of results with, whether it's yoga or dance um, or um, mindful breathing. Um, we do have a lot of tools in schools that are either hand fidgets or chew bands or chair bands for the restless leg that goes. Um, we have a lot. Um, and I think that the same things work at home. Um, we also start to help kids build cognitive strategies that are more like talking back to worry or um, recognizing negative thought patterns that spiral. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it varies from student to student, but there are a lot of tools and there are a lot of good books and websites for parents. And after, I'd be happy to, I brought some. Yeah, and I think an additional strategy, because I absolutely agree with what you say, is is looking at how we're interacting with our child, and we can sometimes change the way that we're languaging things or approaching things, and that can help break the pattern. I mean, I, I tend to look at it as a pattern and that there are a number of different places we can intervene in. Some, some of it is how we interact with them as parents around their anxiety. Some of it is, you know, their cognitive pattern physical changes and really it's finding kind of the best approach for your child that you know at least in my work it, it's very individualized I don't say everybody should do this it's it's what's going to work in your family and for your your child and it'll be different at different ages and stages I think they pretty much covered it I, I, the only thing I wanted to add to is what I liked in the movie was how um, the parents were saying that they were talking about their own experiences too and that a lot of times it is genetic or we do pass it on to our children. Um, so I think that's just, I just wanted to remind that, that that's a really good strategy when you're talking even to a fourth grader and just telling a story or you know, admitting your own when you're feeling stressed out or anxious about something that can be really helpful too and um, so yeah. Did you guys want to say anything? I would, I would add two quick things. One, um, I'd go on a walk without an agenda. Um, I'd, you know, I think that, that students and young, young folks have thoughts and feelings and opinions of the world and what's going on. And just to give them space and time to talk that was referenced on the film. Um, I would also ask us as adults to work really hard, and this was also referenced, not to pass our stress down. Um, we can love our kids, and I say this as a dad, we can love our kids so much that again, sort of echoing something I was saying before, that we want the best for them, so we worry about that they didn't do, or they're struggling on some, about something at school or something in their life, and we, we're casting forward 30 years, and we want them to be happy in 30 years, and so we want to help them fix this. And it just doesn't work that way. And so I think we just ha we have to work hard to not pass our stress down as well. Um, yeah, I would, those things. I would say those two things. We had I forget who I pointed to up here, but yeah, 
way up there. Um, this is, I don't know, it's less like a question for the panel, and I'm just curious as to why so many parents laughed when the father in the movie mentioned how, like, unbelievable it is that so many parents are, as, like, along with him, are so bad at uh, understanding and taking time to listen to their children, because, like, it's just really not that funny that you add to the contribution of making your child's mental health worse and it's just i don't know i found that pretty frustrating that so many people found that funny when it's just really not that funny yeah leaving our bodies um, I think it's it's not laughter like haha this is amusing it's oh my god that's so true and it's and it's and it's such a stress that parents live with all the time to have someone name it I think humor can be a very uh, in, incisive art right a lot of what we laugh at comes out of our anxiety so I think that laughter is a laughter of fear and worry and I don't, I don't think it's a laughter of, of, boy, that's a really amusing thing. What's the next joke? I think it's a, it's a, it's a laughter. F it's coming out of our fear and our, our own worries, I think. Yeah, and I would, I would just add to that that I think, you know, in, at least in my clinical practice, people come in, parents come in, because I, I work with both the child and the parents, and my approach is actually to teach the parents how to coach the child when they're at home because they're the people who are going to be able to intervene when you know th these situations are happening and i almost always parents are worried that you're going to blame them and that that's absolutely you know that's rarely rarely ever the case these in, at least in my work these days but i think traditionally that has happened and so the anxiety around some of this you know being blamed is is very real and understandable I think one of the advantages of this film is to break down that stigma around mental illness and I think and mental health needs and I think that 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 laughter might come from that as well that that huge stigma we have around uh, mental health needs in this country. Thank you. Um, first off, I just want to say um, a real big thank you for bringing this film here. I think this has been really, really good. Um, I um, have been listening you know, to folks and I, I wanted to share a little bit and just reflect um, as a parent who is diagnosed with anxiety disorder. Um, my student career, my first memory of having a panic attack was when I was five and went to kindergarten and that separation from my mother, um, vomiting, um, tears, this went on for several days until I was able to eventually transition to the bookend of it, the other end, the last panic attack connected to my academic career was after my dissertation was completely finished and it was time for me to take the final draft to go turn it in and I had this just unreasonable panic attack that somehow I must not have done all my citations correctly. So hysterical tears, throwing up, pretty much just resembling exactly what I went through when I was five, you know, many, many years later, really at the bookends of my academic career. But I made it through it all, you know, from kindergarten to the doctorate. Um, I have gifted my children with my anxiety disorder. Um, so now dealing with my own and also seeing it in them and parenting them and helping them cope. Um, but, you know, I, reflecting in the film, it does get better. I cried through much of the film because I see myself in it, I see my kids in it, I'm sorry. But, you know, the, the second, thank you so much for bringing this here and really kind of bringing awareness to this, which is a challenge, but it does get better and you do get through it. And I'm a pretty functioning, capable adult, 
most of the time, you know. <laughs> so. Thank you. And I'm not nervous in the least of tripping. <laughs> um, piggybacking on a lot of what everybody said, um, I um, have three sons who all went here, very well-known kids, um, all very different, obviously, as all kids are. And one of the things, and, and we were a very well-known family, and um, one of them, some people here know him especially very well, um, was not like the other two. And, um, or none of them were alike, but this one was, a boy, this film, I wish I had seen it when he was young, because the avoidance um, began in fourth grade. Um, and throughout his career um, in the Portland schools, he was very, his, I say to him now, he's in college, that his best skill is gathering around him, grow, especially grown-ups or people higher up in the totem pole than him, um, who support, understand, and, and bring him through. It wasn't always that way. A couple of the, th and, and I must make a shout out to Jane Sawtell over there. I'm, I can't say enough about, he's a very talented musician. Um, one of the problems might be that he's a very talented musician. Um, and she, when he was in seventh grade, um, made uh, district, one of the high, district, something very hard to, to make. And um, the night before, he's like, I'm not going, I can't do this. He had worked with his teacher, he had worked with Jane. And as a parent, you're sometimes, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir because you're all here. As a parent, you want, you know, it's hard to admit to somebody outside of your own little chaotic household that your kid is not perfect, is having big troubles, is leaving school, you know. Um, but I called her, she was a teacher and a parent. Um, and as a teacher and a fellow musician, she, counseled me and counseled him through this process and re continued to through probably almost currently. Um, and as a parent, this is one of the things that I, I'm not a very embarrassed parent usually, um, but I can't say enough about reaching out and not feeling embarrassed about your child's reaction, feeling, um, scared people are going to judge you, reach out to other parents, ask the school if there's a parent like me who you can pour your little heart out and believe me, the middle of the night was a very scary time and nobody would have thought that of my kids. And, a lot, and this mostly had to do with this very talented young student being probably very talented and, um, and he did have, it wasn't just, he wasn't just anxious, to this day, he has to battle through, and, and it does get better. But um, I want to say the the teachers and the people who see. I remember at one point with one of my sons, I reached out to Jack Dawson, who runs a camp here. Said, "Is is it okay that my child? This is not this child. Is screaming in the car that he lost color war at Chevrolet." camp and he diagnosed this it was one of the more important things I learned as a parent so reaching out to this group and in Portland schools is and don't be embarrassed by that your child isn't reacting the way you know the kid in the in the movie does not other movies so. it'd be interesting for you all to comment on just the what you can provide as educators, both social workers and teachers, to support students um, with a variety of these needs, if anyone can comment on that. Um, yeah, I, it, it's a great opportunity to say that I, I, I did want to um, put in a little plug for Portland Public Schools because 
we're really lucky. I mean, it's a great district that really does. I think the teachers, the staff, everybody from the the lunch ladies that, you know, I get lots of referrals as a social worker from them when the kid goes into the cafeteria and they notice a change. And I mean, I, I mean, obviously you all have your students in formal public schools, so hopefully you know this, but I just think we're really, really lucky. A lot of districts don't have as many support services as we do, so I, I think um, we try really, really hard to take care of your kids when they're in school, so it's, I'm glad you had a great experience. I want to jump back for a second because I felt like there should be a response to what you said, and uh, which is that, at, you know, absolutely, it's it's hard to see your children struggle with what you have, but also on the other hand, you're able to role model, you know, and with a lot of credibility and reality, how one persists in spite of you know, those feelings and those experiences and, you know, kind of linking in what you were talking about as well. I think that's really helpful to have role models who, like Mark Phelps in the movie, you know, they are dealing with this as well and here's how they're dealing with it. Because I think when kids start to have those feelings and ideas that they, and I, heard, I was attending to some of the language people use, like, I can't do this. I, you know, whereas I would think of it as, well, okay, it feels really uncomfortable. And that's what you are role modeling. You are modeling, yeah, you can, fe it can feel impossible and you can still do it. And I think it's really important to have people in your lives who, who are demonstrating that and modeling that for you or for your child, so. Take one more question. Um, there were two points made in the movie that um, probably in the surface they kind of conflict each other in regards of the tools given and what to do. And on one side, the advice is to not avoid. And as a parent, when you get the text, I need to leave now, come and pick me up, don't jump. On the other side is take a break, go for a walk. So where is that demarcation line? And uh, how, is it like wait five minutes and then react? Or how to recognize that, that is he or she spiraling and I have to go pick her up? Or is she safe enough that she can handle it? and tell her, stay five minutes and handle it. So what, what is that line? And we have another yeah. quick question here. I just wanted to say, is there, I know they talked about exposure therapy, which I know is fairly new. Is there training um, to staff at Portland Public Schools for that? You know, exposing the kids to what they're afraid of? So let's start with that first question about where do you kind of draw the line? It's a tough question. Okay. No. Well, it, it's, it's a very good question and I think it really depends on each child individually. There are some kids that I see where I would, you know, definitely my first preference would be for the child to be able to cope with whatever's going on in the situation they're in. So if they're at school having a panic attack, I would try to coordinate with the social workers or staff at school to see if the child can help deal with it and master it in that environment as opposed to leaving, fleeing, which, you know, then the next goal for us is going to be trying to get them back to school to deal with it here. So, but beyond that, it, it is kind of on a more case-by-case -case basis based on, you know, kind of the mental status of that child, but, but definitely working with, you know, the staff here who, who you know, for my work with them and other schools do a phenomenal job with kids who are socially anxious or having panic attacks, but coordinating is super important. Yeah, I agree, but I, and I think they are, they, are they, they sound contradictory, but I think they're distinctly separate concepts. So the first concept is 
you can't hide from anxiety and have it get better. It will only get worse. And the second concept is those breaks, people weren't hiding. With every break they discussed, they discussed a coping strategy mechanism. So they went through a whole series of them. So a student, the student listening to music was trying to recenter themselves. It was, a, it was a coping strategy. It wasn't hiding from the anxiety, not coming to school, not going out of your bedroom, not facing and I can't deal with it, getting deeper and deeper into that hole was the, what they were saying you can't do. So find, get professional help um, to find effective coping mechanisms and keep working on those um, even when you are anxious. So I think that they, I'm not sure they did a great job delineating between the two, but I think the two separate concepts. Uh, we have a lot of students on special plans in school to make sure that we accommodate um, something that might be going on for them so they can keep learning. And we shouldn't be writing plans that always, that, that make it so students are, are never in a situation that ever causes them stress. It's probably not a great plan. We should say, hey, you know, we're going to, school is a good place to be, work is, we're going to try to put you into work that's reasonable, and when you feel anxious, we're going to, you know, nothing wrong with leaving, working with a social worker, that's a great thing, going back into the situation, we're going to help you cope, but we're not going to say you never have to do homework, you never have to come to school, you never have to. And I think those were the two concepts at work. Um, I'm going to quote a friend of mine who teaches second grade that Tom knows very well, and um, I, tr I try to keep her in mind all the time with my students, and she says there are three things that matters, matter as an educator to her, and it's relationships, relationships, and relationships. And like I will say, I had a bunch of my students performing today, and I actually said to one of them, I don't really know you well enough to know how hard I can push you. Can I push you right now? And she said, no, but maybe next week. So <laughs> um, for me, that's I just try to find out as much as I can about them in really casual ways. And it, it does help me sort of notice when things are maybe a little more awry than, than they should be. And then I'll call Sophie. <laughs> um, I want to sort of address the question about exposure therapy. Um, and I mean, it's a pretty, they, they they sort of gave a kind of simplistic view of it. It's m much more difficult than that, yeah. Um, and I wouldn't, I mean, we don't, I mean, I took a course on it in the summer just because it was part of a th another class, but it's not something I think that generally we as school staff would be encouraged to do. I think if someone's looking for exposure therapy, we would definitely look to be referring out to someone who can do that because we're a lot more sort of just crisis kind of like in the moment, but it is actually, it's, it is the most well-researched and proven method for anxiety, and so it is really a great technique. It's, um, you probably, I don't know, you might know more about it. Yeah, um, definitely that's something that you would do in therapy and um, very effective technique. I, this was a very oversimplified example. Um, in my practice, we learn coping skills so that I'm not just throwing the child in the deep end and saying, okay, now you're a 90 and hey, party on, you know, and go up and ask the person. It would be, okay, you're at a 90. Let's see if we can try to change our self-talk. Let's see if we can do some breathing. Can we bring that down a little? And we're going to have you go and, you know, still go to the counter and ask the person what they think. But you want to have some coping skills, in, in my, in, at least in my opinion, on board as well, not just go and do it. But, but it's a very individualized process and, you know, very intense. I mean, sometimes if there's an issue in school, I would go with the child to coach them through it. I wouldn't expect the school staff to to take that on because it's, you know, <laughs> right, or, you know, but we can, it's just so detailed and, and personal and such a process, that's, that's all. But. So at the elementary level, um, typically exposure therapy can show up, but we're usually cooperating with an outside therapist's plan and that family will contact you know, me as a school-based social worker, and we will work together with the outpatient therapist. In, in young children, it's a very common 
to have anxiety, general anxiety um, disorder show up in weather concerns, thunderstorms and lightning and wind storms are the big ones. So we have had to work with an outside therapist who is involved in an exposure and desensitization process with a student and we bring the thunder and lightning into school because it usually interferes with a student attending school on those days where the weather forecast is either bad or it's already begun before school starts or they leave early once it starts. So we have all sorts of, I mean the internet has made this much easier. We have all sorts of weather yeah. YouTube things that we can use so that we gradually tolerate weather at school. But again, that's part of a larger treatment plan. And actually one more thing I'd add about um, exposure is the little dog that I mentioned that I had that became anxious about silver shiny things. That's exactly what we did with him is we would carry treats, he would go you know, across the street when there was a manhole, then we'd slowly move closer and closer, giving him treats, and eventually that wasn't an issue for him anymore. I mean, definitely terrifying for him at the time, but later not an issue at all, which is pretty typical with exposure for in the most part. So if I could have a round of applause for our panelists, I really appreciate them coming out. Thank you very much for coming. We are going to post some resources. Check back on our um, website for f at um, parentu.portlandschools.org. We'll put some resources there. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. <laughs>